Welcome to Miami Beach Urban Studios on this fine Monday evening. My name is Colette Mello and I'm in conversation today with Miami-based artist Kim Moore. Thank you all for joining us. FIU Miami Beach Urban Studios is an incubator for communication, architecture, and the arts, and a collider for people, design, and technology. I'd like to thank Miami Beach Department of Tourism and Office of Cultural Affairs for sponsoring these art talks. Kim Moore is a Miami-based artist that has a creative practice that documents her life through painting, fiber, and sculpture. Her practice intersects feminism, domesticity, and fashion. She earned her Bachelor of Arts in Painting at Bard University and her MFA from Florida International University. Kim has exhibited here at Miami Beach Urban Studios, the Frost Art Museum, the Skya Museum and Gardens, Mac Fine Gallery, the Bakehouse Art Complex, the laundromat art space and art surf. I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that if you have any comments or questions to make them through the chat function and I will try to get to them throughout our conversation. Hi Kim, it's great to see you. Thank you for joining us today. I'm so happy to be here. So first of all, tell us where you are and how have you been? I haven't really been able to catch up with you in a while. Well, glad you asked. Uh, we've been in quarantine for a long time. Oh. <laughs> um, actually, everything's pretty much back to normal in my life. Uh, it turns out that my day job um, is uh, necessary. And so we were back in the office in May. So I've been doing that. Um, and I have one child who's still in school. They're going to school every day. And my daughter, who's an adult now, is working. So it's almost as if nothing's changed at this point, except that we have the biggest collection of masks you've ever seen. Which I love your mask, by the way. <laughs> and I'm sure you'll show us some of them. I'll show you. Um, yeah, so I know that um, I, I follow you on Facebook, so I know you had shared um, that you thought you had um, gotten coronavirus in the very beginning of us being locked down and you were very sick. Um, and I was really surprised when you said that you had to go back to work because you're, you're an essential worker. I was Quite surprised to find that out too, but I work for a company that manufactures PPE among other things. And so that's how we ended up back. Um, I did, I, be, I became very ill in April with symptoms of COVID. Uh, at the time I was too sick to get tested because I couldn't drive myself anywhere and plus none of the tests were any good. Um, I was quite ill. My doctor was very up on the research and the stuff that he prescribed is what they're still prescribing now. So I began to get better after about five or six days of medication, but um, I continued to have problems with breathing and I developed um, a leaky valve in my heart, which is probably related to the virus. I don't have any proof that it was coronavirus because I didn't get tested, but sometimes when you have a virus, there's a little bit of heart damage. So that's what happened to me. Um, I basically was given the green light to stop quarantining on April 30th. And so then I was back in the office May 4th. Wow. Well, I'm glad that you seem better. I'm sorry that you, you're still having like after effects of, of the illness. So yeah, wear a mask, social distance. Yeah. yeah, no, I agree. So, so go ahead and start your presentation. I'm excited to, to see what you've been up to. So I just wanted to start out with just a couple works that I had done uh, during my graduate years um, and maybe talk a little bit about how that started out. A lot of my work focuses on my domestic life. Um, I paint in my house, I live in my house, my children are in my house, basically everything pretty much except for my day job happens in the house. So there's a lot of focus on domesticity and day-to-day -day mundane things, but things that are, while they're mundane, they're still um, an important part of uh, my practice in that it's very 
much like um, meditation because you're doing the same thing again and again and again. And so um, there's a part of the practice that's kind of relaxing and getting yourself ready for the day. So the still lifes that you see are, you know, my dish drainer, my sink. And what had really gotten me started on it was how the dish drainer itself is a microcosm of our family life. The first still life that I had done, which I don't have a picture of, um, just contained all of the weird stuff that happens in a house when you have teenagers and a roommate from China. And so the, the, there were the normal things in there, like pig pans and knives and then chopsticks because my roommate only cooks with chopsticks. And then there were paint brushes because they need to dry. And then there was a project that somebody was working on. And I just thought, wow, this really is who we are. And so I started taking a look at it. Um, obviously, I'm very interested in line and color, but not particularly interested in realism. And so um, my work kind of reflects that pretty noticeably, I guess. I, I always feel like this real pull between whether it's drawing or painting. And so I kind of combine both in everything I do. This is another picture that I did around the same time. They're very big. This one's, I believe the last time I measured, it's like 40 by 50 inches or something. Wow. So it's, it's, it's pretty noticeable. Um, and then I put in a couple shots of a show that I had. Where, where was this again? Art Surf. Art Surf. I remember the floor. <laughs> Sometimes they start to run together. So this was a show I did at Art Surf. Um, with Colette and a bunch of other people. And it, it shows kind of a variety of the pieces. Um, if you look at it, you see the black lines, that is usually charcoal because I start out with charcoal background, a charcoal drawing. And I try to show every single layer. I'm very interested in what happens before and what happens afterwards. And I like to have all of the layers showing at the same time. So you've got your your basic sketch still showing. And I paint right up to the edge of the charcoal, recognizing, of course, how risky that is, especially since I use oil paint. So that's kind of where my painting is. Um, that's generally how I work. I start out with a, a quick drawing of something that I've seen, and then I start working in the paint. Um, also, at the time when I was in school, I was really looking at how we raise our daughters because at that time it appeared that I had two daughters. And so I was really thinking about um, beautification and how we pass these ideas on to our children about what's important, um, you know, in every single way. Like I'm painting my toenails so I can go out on a date. So now my kids are painting their toenails. Now, am I bringing them up to try to make themselves pleasing to men? It was like this whole thing I was thinking about. And um, so I had I'd done a couple pieces, well, a lot of pieces actually, probably about 10, just looking at that kind of um, beautification process and what it means to try to make yourself attractive. And I also had fairly young children at the time. so it was weird to me to be training them up to try to be attractive to men when they were, you know, eight and 12. And so, but it happens with everything. This was just one particular thought that I kind of focused on when I was looking at that idea. Sure. So then most recently I, um, oops, I did it backwards. Okay. Most recently, I've been trying to find ways to work, um, this is like over the past two years, on something that is easily portable because I do have a full-time job in order to take care of everybody, but I also wanna be able to work you know, in something that's smaller, that I can easily reach, and also that's very tactile. And if you look at the frog in the corner, we were at the zoo and this frog was up against the glass and I was thinking about how you can kind of see the inside of the frog coming through its skin. And I really started thinking about how 
there's there's an inside and an outside or a top and a bottom. So I began to work on sketchbooks for the sketchbook project that incorporated fabric scraps that I had gotten on FreeCycle. So they weren't my fabric scraps, they were somebody else's projects, but I had all of this leftover fabric from somebody else making, I don't know what, something, something amazing probably. And I started going through them and making designs and I was sewing with the needle and thread on paper. So I was puncturing the paper and as a result, it shows the design on both sides. So then I had to start thinking about how one design or idea was acting on the one on the other side. So you can see the stitching from both pieces kind of working, you know, either for or against each other, depending on what was going on. Um, so then I really love these. I love the, the it's like a collage and the, well, yeah. you know, I love a propensity to, to the fiber art. So I really like these. And these are found, you said you got them. What's, so tell me about FreeCycle. What was that with the material? So, <laughs> this is really funny. FreeCycle is an organization where you can get rid of your stuff without throwing it away. So it's kind of free plus recycle. And um, people give away everything. You know, you can get rid of your couch, you can get rid of clothes. And actually, um, this woman had offered candle making supplies and I needed more wax. So that's what I was actually interested in. Uh, but she also listed that she had these, these fabric scraps left over from quilting. And I was like, oh, maybe the kids can use them. Plot twist. So when I'm working with it, since, you know, if you buy your own fabric, you kind of know what it looks like. But when it's someone else's, you don't know what they were going to do with it. And I keep wondering, you know, what was she going to use it for? And then I was matching up different colors to see you know, different pieces to see what they would look like together. So after I completed that book and mailed it in, I was really, really, really thinking about inside and outside. And I was thinking about dissections. I was still thinking about these see-through frogs a lot. They're completely transparent and you can see their insides from outside. And I was really, like, I'm, I'm very I'm fascinated by it. I really am. And so I, I started to do pieces that were animals. And then I was showing not only their organs, but I was using embroidery to stitch the, um, their uh, pulmonary system. And that went great until I decided to do clams, but it turns out, who knew, they have an open circulatory system, which means there are no veins. It was really, really disappointing for me to find this out after I had already drawn it on one of the pages of the book. So then I kind of had a dilemma and I ended up doing a scallop and a clam. <laughs> There's no, <laughs> they, they, they don't have any vein. So what um, was but, this project for? What was this? You said you sent it in. The sketchbook project. Okay. So the Brooklyn Art Library is a oh, group. Oh, the Brooklyn Art, okay. Yeah, a, a group that um, has sketchbooks from artists all over the world. And they're all on these little, um, they're small notebooks, they're about five by eight. And they send them out and people fill them up and then send them back and they have a library with art from all ages, all over the world, different levels of ability, creativity. People do different stuff with it. And it's kind of, I like books, I like making books, I like, you to be able to touch what I'm working on. So that part was really appealing to me. It's also a small format, so I can stick it in my lunch bag and bring it with me. Um, but yeah, if you're interested in doing it, they, they'll, they accept donations from everybody. You, you, um, you get the sketchbook, you fill it up, you send it back, then they travel all over the country having exhibitions when it's not COVID-19. So this is an ongoing project that they have. Yeah, I oh, want nice. to say that I did my first book like 10 years ago. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, super well, long time ago. These are fan fantastic. I love these. Oh, okay. And then I also started working on pieces um, that aren't in a book. And this is where I'm running into some trouble um, because I can't figure out how to display them because they're two-sided 
pieces of paper. And so this is something I'm still considering how to handle it. Uh, in the lower image, the lower images, you can see there's also a thread trailing off of it because I kind of like that unfinished look. Um, but I haven't quite figured out exactly how I want to display them. I had a couple different thoughts, such as hang it from like a cliff and you can turn it around depending on how you want to look at it or make a frame so that it sticks out of the wall. But this is still unresolved. <laughs> I'm going to make some more and see what happens. I and, like the idea of you hanging it with clips yeah, I from mean, the ceiling um, and being able to walk around it. To be able to see all the different sides. Right. So that's kind of where I am right now, is trying to figure out how I want to treat it. But I am still, I'm very, very interested in how the top and the bottom or the front and the back work on each other. And, so these, um, these four works is the front and back, front and back. Yeah. Oh, these are really wonderful. Nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My brother especially loves this one because he's a, a scientist who studied trout. <laughs> and what's the scale of these, Kim? These are nine by 12 inches. They're very small. Okay. They're not, you know, they're not huge pieces, which is kind of small for me. I, I know it's a normal size for other people, but it's pretty small for me. What's next? Oh, okay. So my silk painting. I don't know if I've shown this to you before. Um, again, having to do with small children. Uh, when my first one was born, I was still just mainly doing oil painting. And that worked great until she was about 18 months old at which point she was really good at climbing. And um, I'm, all I'm gonna say is, luckily we were in a rental, so it wasn't a big deal what happened to the walls. But after that, I really had to make some decisions. First of all, I've had barely any time left. And second, I just couldn't leave wet paint lying around because she was everywhere. So I began doing silk painting. And the technique I use is um, called the Surti method. You draw, and you can see why this is appealing to me, right? I've seen enough of the pictures. You draw the outlines and then you fill it in with color. And there's a lot of advantages to it. First of all, you definitely have to do it in steps. So if you've only got an hour or two, you can get started and work on it the next day and nothing's going to happen. The paint is supposed to dry. It's not like you start an oil painting and you work on it 10 days later and it's kind of sticky. So you don't have that problem. And it also addresses an issue of having useless art which is something I think about a lot. Um, and that one of the appealing things is that I can paint basically a watercolor painting and somebody can wear it around their neck or around their head or do whatever they want to with, do with it. And so they have art with them that's you know very transportable. And then in the background here, I don't know if you guys can see it, it's not showing on my screen. There's a little sketch. We go to the Everglades all the time and do like one minute sketches of stuff we see. So it's like a big inspiration for me. These are, I really love this. And I know I haven't seen this before. Um, and I see, yeah, we do see your image at the bottom of the alligator. I really love that. So when was this made? Which? The, the alligator scar. The drawing or the scarf? The scarf? The scarf. Um, February. Okay. So yeah. that was your last trip to probably the Everglades before yeah, the pandemic. Yeah. yeah. It was. I think we went one more time, but we could only go for a day trip. We couldn't stay. Because you usually go camping there, right? You and your, your daughters will go and um, spend a two we or three days. Every month in the winter so that we can see how it changes, how the water goes down and the different animals that come and go, and especially the birds, because... We're all pretty obsessed with birds and alligators. Nice. So that's a trip we make all the time. So I have a million sketches that I've done, a million. I have a comment from Pip. Kim, you did a great silk painting oh, workshop yeah. in my fiber class, spring of 2019. That's right. It was a fun class too. I went after work and um, everybody in the class was super nice and they were really, really excited about it. I was just showing them, I was demonstrating the techniques for silk painting. Um, so Pip, did they start painting afterwards on silk? I don't know if she can talk. She might be on mute. Oh. Let me see, hold on. Let me see if I can open her up. 
Where's Pip? Unmute. Yeah, you know, Brandy's still doing it. Oh, really? Yeah. And, and they did it for a while, but Brandy kind of stuck with it. That's awesome. That's yeah. So cool. <laughs> yeah, really. She, uh, she bought all this. Somebody else bought all the stuff, too. And then, uh, and then when it was work with it out, you know, after class was done, because I think by the time they got this stuff, you know, class was done, but no, that was like a fun day. It was great. Yeah, it was. And they were so creative too. Everybody they were. A totally different way of using the materials. Yeah. I mean, it's so, it's so, sen it's kind of sensual to do. I mean, it's, it's so sensory. Yeah, it is. It is, and I really like that um, even though it's kind of controlled, you still, there's so many accidents that can happen. Right. There's a risk. It's kind of like why I like ceramics. <laughs> <laughs> there's so many chances for failure. <laughs> okay, so this is what we've been doing during the pandemic. We have been making a lot of masks. Um, I work in the fashion industry, and uh, Everybody needs a new clean mask every single day. So after about a month and a half, I decided it was time to start getting fancy and bling it up. And so I've been making a lot of different masks. Um, you can see that I've done some of the silk painting to make masks. And uh, I've been really into embroidery recently. Um, again, something small, portable, you can easily carry it. Um, but yeah, so that's what I've been doing. Um, I have. How many masks do you think you've made? Oh gosh, I don't know. All um, right. No, maybe about, I'm gonna say 60 or 70. It's not like my main activity. It's just, um, I do sell them online, but also I made a bunch to donate to just because you know people needed them. Mm -hmm. And then um, you get bored of the ones you have or the elastic stops working or whatever. So. We've probably got about 30 hanging on the front door right now. Yeah, I love these masks. Um, and the fox is very cute, too. And that's embroidery? Yeah, that's embroidery. But that was, that, that's like nothing special. That's just from a design. It wasn't like something I made up and, and figured it out. Nice. And we, everybody, please wear your masks since we're talking about masks and social distance. Since we're talking about that, coronavirus is still here. So this is um, what's happening currently, um, painting in my Florida room. Um, and I've been, uh, somebody gave me a bunch of old canvases that belonged to somebody in their family. So I painted over them and they were really textured. That was great, I was very excited about that. Um, I regessed them and then I drew on them with charcoal. So now I've got like several different renditions of the same thing with all these different layers like a palimpsest so that to me is really exciting and fun I love it um so that's one of the things that I'm working on besides you know sewing paper <clears throat> and then um still life I always seem to come back to it uh this is also kind of indicative of my life um nobody's deathly ill uh there's just um mental illness in the family and so it's something we have to talk about every single day. And I don't know, the bottles somehow looked kind of beautiful to me. I really, really like Mirandi's work. And so I'm kind of always attracted to still life and still life paintings of bottles. So that was definitely something that influenced this. This one's tiny, it's small. I like, Kim, that your work, um, you've talked about this before with your work being about your life, how, what you're going through. I don't know if you're showing this later. You, um, when you did an exhibition at Embus, I think it was Liminal Space. Oh, yeah. I think that's coming up. Okay. I'll let you talk about that then. Okay. okay. So then here's a couple little pieces I did. Um, got the easy button with the uh, AR-15 really <laughs> um yeah wow it's a big big issue for me and you can really get that thing for 614 no 612 dollars and 44 cents off the internet you can just buy it just like that 
Um, and then on the other side, I have some collages that I did uh, addressing just some current issues that were going on. I had been talking to a colleague about raising my children to be feminists, and I just thought that that was a no-brainer, that obviously you need to raise your children to be feminists. And I was met with great surprise because I don't know, this was a younger person who maybe thought that we'd already so solved all the problems or something, that sexism was gone. I don't know. Um, and then the lower one is, um, it's talking, it, it had to do with different kinds of performative art. And it was the woman who got stabbed at Art Basel a few years ago, and some of the people thought it was art. So I was kind of thinking about how can you tell if it's art or not? You know, what is it that makes it art? And what is it that stops people at the same time from intervening in a violent thing, a violent action? Because that also happens. So I was just kind of looking at those different ideas to see how they played off of each other. I remember that with uh, Basil with the lady and people yeah. were just standing back. And then recently, I don't know, maybe a couple years ago, there was a film, I think, um, what is it? The Miami Dade Film Festival. They had a movie, The Square. I don't know if you saw that about the art world. And again, it was about um, some intervention with a person terrorizing everyone. Everybody thought it was artwork. So they all just stood back and no mm -hmm. one did anything. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, art's crazy. So this is, these are all parts of an installation piece that I've been working on. Um, um, just It's called The Suicide Project. It's, uh, it's me working through my sister's death by suicide. Um, she died three and a half years ago. And uh, battled with mental illness and trying to figure out what medications to take and what not to take. And it was a very intense time in my life. She also lived in another state, which really is very difficult to get medical care for an adult living in another state who doesn't necessarily want help. So it was a really quite a tough time in my life. And, um, we mostly communicated by text message, uh, like forever, you know, ever since texting happened, we would talk every day by text or, you know, through Facebook or something. And so when she made her suicide attempt the first time, she texted me and I woke up in the middle of the night, I think because the phone lit up and I just, you know, it was such a crazy, crazy time in my life. Um, so it really got me to thinking because then the next step is the doctors want to find medication to help you and they want to find therapy to help you. And so um, she would contact me and say, I know your kids are taking medication for depression and for anxiety. And because one of my kids happens to have bipolar disorder, you know, what medications are your kids taking that work? Because my doctors feel like um, there's a familial connection and we might be able to use the same ones. So every morning at my house for the past um, seven years, uh, everybody, you know, I put out the pills and people take different medications and vitamins. And um, again, you know, I look at it as a, everything as a still life. And so I started looking at the little flower plates that I was putting the kids meds on. And I was like, oh, look, you know, look at these little pictures. So this installation um, consists of 30 of these little paintings. They're six by six inches. And there's 30 of them because that's how many pills you get in a one month prescription. And they are hung over a couch. And then there's this soft, fluffy fleece blanket on the couch. And I don't know if you can see from where you are, but the um, images on it are the warning papers that you get with your medications. So, you know, on the one hand, you've got something that's hopefully going to comfort you and help you and also that you can die from. And so this is definitely something that's really, you know, I keep thinking about it. Um, my kids have been very, very lucky to find therapies that work. A lot of people don't. Um, and it was really hard helping my sister. Um, I will flat out tell you, I picked my children 
they were small children and I picked them. I had to protect them first. Um, and so this is something that I continue to do with my uh, kind of political work, if you will. Um, I talk to my representatives and I give them information about suicide. Um, I'm working on getting some information about how to have educational programs in schools that um, they can use to help the teachers and the students. And so this is just, you know, this is something that also talks, it, this, it's part of my art, it's part of my life, it's happening to me. Wow, I'm so glad that you're doing, you're bringing awareness to this because this is like a topic and I know you, you do talk about it, you're very open about all of this. Um, but what a great project. This is amazing. Thank you. Yeah. It's very important to be open about it because people feel a lot of shame and they don't seek help. So it's really, I feel very important to say, yes, my sister died by suicide. She didn't commit suicide. She didn't have an unexpected accident. She didn't die suddenly, you know, like all, all of these different euphemisms that people use. She died by suicide. And most people who do make suicide attempts can be helped if they can get the proper help if you can stop them. So it's important to keep the information out there. You wanna move on to a slightly brighter topic? Okay, but I think this is a really important topic and I'm glad you're doing it. And I, ho uh, I, I hope that maybe um, we can work on something together. Yeah, I would love to, yeah, I would love to. There needs important. to be more transparency about it. So this last piece that I'm going to show you is called Liminal Space. And um, what you see on the floor are a thousand paper cranes. Actually, there's not a thousand in this picture, but what had started out as a thousand paper cranes. My sister folded them for me for my marriage and my marriage ended. And I had kids. I know this keeps coming up, but it really does inform my art all the time. And um, the paper cranes had been in a huge glass bowl in the dining room their entire lives. And I felt like I couldn't just throw them away and be like, yep, that's it. I'm throwing away your father. I'm throwing away the cranes, you know, whatever. And so I spent a lot of time thinking about what to do about it. And um, then I learned about slip dip. And um, one of the grad students had made you know, ceramic popcorn that way. And I thought, I'm gonna try this out. It was the same time, uh, it was around the time when my father had died and I had gotten back into ceramics to make urns for um, my siblings. And I thought about this as being kind of like a whole bunch of little tiny urns, you know, because once you cooked them in the um, kiln, everything inside turns to ash. So I slip dipped a thousand paper cranes. Some of them didn't make it because of the type of paper that my sister had used. And um, I talked to my pastor and decided that on the 1,000th day after my divorce was finalized, I would have a service of hope, healing, and gratitude. And the cranes were part of the service. So, that's where this project had started out with just, you know, this, this whole, like, first of all, mundane practice of dipping them. It takes a really long time to dip a thousand cranes twice or three times, let me tell you. And then even putting them into the kiln took a long time. Um, so I just really saw it as a kind of a moving forward, like um, my old life had kind of died and been buried. The new life uh, is so much better. So, then I was thinking about what else to do with them and Colette had said something about doing an installation and I thought about you know the phoenix coming out of the fire and so when I had put in this installation I didn't use all of the, the um, cranes because there's like a zillion of them um, but I put in the red cloth just because I was thinking you know fire flames or the phoenix or you know something like that and um, that's kind of where I went with that. Yes, I remember this. So this was the second iteration, and then you did a third iteration, and then you did a fourth, right? Do you want to elaborate on those really quickly? Yeah, well, so then I also was, um, where's that place? ArtServe. I did it at ArtServe, and then 
um, you know, a lot of the little pieces get broken or whatever. But then recently I was um, decorating uh, a tree outside of my house and I glued the birds on because it was, it had to do with peace and, you know, something like that. So uh, I keep using them for stuff. I keep thinking I'm done and then I come up with another project because I know I told you it was going to be the last one when you did it the first time. Yes. Yes. But I like that it's still going on. You're still working with them. Yeah. Something keeps coming up. Okay. So here's my next project that everybody can participate in. Remember how this year was supposed to be the best year ever because all of the major holidays were going to be on the weekends? Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, we yeah. missed a lot of them, and I figured out the best way to deal with this. We are going to catch up on all of the holidays we missed on New Year's Eve. So you're going to need to get prepared. There's going to be costume changes. You're going to need... Um, some activities and specific food, and you're gonna have to take pictures so we can prove it happened. So here's the schedule, guys. You're gonna start out with St. Patrick's Day at six. You're gonna wear green, Irish soda bread, green beer. Seven o'clock is Easter. You're gonna wear your Easter bonnet and dye Easter eggs, and you can even eat chocolate. Eight o'clock, gay pride parade. We totally missed that this year. Get fancy. Cocktails, you have to have good cocktails and then go up and down your block. Nine o'clock, 4th of July, sparklers or fireworks, depends on your neighbors. 10, Halloween, you have to put on your costumes and remember, we're taking pictures of all of this. 11 is going to be Thanksgiving, give us a little extra energy before we go to sleep, turkey dinner, have some pie. I suggest listening to Alice's restaurant because I really anticipate that we're gonna have more civil disobedience needed in 2021. So I want you to get inspired for the new year. And then at midnight, you're gonna put on your fancy dress. You're gonna have grapes and champagne, and then you're gonna get a broom and sweep 2020 out the door. So that's my plan. And I hope you're all going to join in. I think that's a really good plan. And I'm in <laughs> for sure, cause you're right. We missed all the holidays and it was a good year for holidays because of the way they fell on the calendar and we were all preparing for those nice long weekends. So, but I think this is a good plan. And what did you say about Valentine's Day? You didn't include okay. it? Well, I didn't include it because we did have Valentine's Day. Okay. Um, and I personally had a great time because uh, I had a party with a whole bunch of friends and we had all this food and my friend, okay. this beautiful setup with red and white and everything was gorgeous. But if, if you didn't have a good one, just do a do-over. Do it at five and have heart-shaped cookies and tea. That'll give you some energy for the rest of the night. Okay. That sounds like a great plan. So I want to open it up to uh, any questions or comments from any of our uh, visitors and guests. I do have one comment. Um, um, thank you so much. I had a close family member who committed suicide. Um, this is Maria Lino, uh, Peruvian artist who also had a series with ceramic cranes. His work is very beautiful. I recommend looking at his website. Oh, very nice. So. That's cool. nice. Um, so yeah, one of the things I find interesting about your artwork is that it's very much a document of your life. You know, um, you're, you're dealing with um, healthcare, you're dealing with um, divorce, you're dealing with suicide, you're dealing with all these issues that we're all dealing with, but no one's really, you know, talking about or they're talking about but they're not making art about do you want to talk about that for a minute why that's important to you or why is that has that always been part of your practice or is that something that um it's evolved i would say it's evolved but i think also um you have to have a way of dealing with the things that happen in life um and everybody does it in a different way some people you know do weightlifting um, but I make art about what's happening to me or, you know, what's happening in my family or what I'm going through. And 
I, I think that it helps me process what's going on. Um, so I also, like I said, I have to find a way to fit art into my life and my schedule. And so however I can cram it in, I do it. So I guess it's going to be whatever's happening to me is going to have to have input into it. Well, I like you. Um, I know how you said you do your, your paintings are large, but you, you've been able to do the smaller um, fiber works because you're able to take it to work with you. Yeah. And you stay, you know, creative, even though you're working a nine to five, or I don't know what your hours are, nine to six job and, and you know, deal and your hands are full. You have a family and you're a single mother. So you're, you're doing a lot. And you're also working, um, all of you, um, I don't know, Kim, if it's okay if I share, but you were canvassing for oh, yeah, Biden. <laughs> you were canvassing for Biden, so I know you were spending a lot of time on the weekends going out and trying to get people to vote. Yeah, I'll tell you the truth, guys. I don't have any trouble sleeping at night. <laughs> I'm just going nonstop all the time. We did do some canvassing. Um, you know, it kind of sucks in Florida because it's so darn hot or it's a thunderstorm, whichever, your choice. Um, and it was an interesting experience. I went with my younger child who's 16 and can't vote and is also a transgender person. So politics are something that we have to worry about all the time, especially here. And, um, but we would talk to people, especially young people who really didn't want to vote because they didn't want to bother, but they were too embarrassed to admit it to my 16 year old. So then they would lie to us and say they were going to, <laughs> I don't know, it was kind of heartwarming. <laughs> Maybe in four years they'll vote, I don't know. But they just really, there was just something really sweet about it. But they didn't want us to know they weren't actually gonna bother voting. <laughs> I don't understand that if they're registered to vote and it was so easy to vote. I mean, now that it's, it's going to be contested, of course, with our president with mail-in voting, because when you're canvassing, you're going only to the Dems, the Democrats. Yeah, you're not going to, uh, yeah, you're not going to Republicans. You're only going to register Democrats that have registered, right? Yeah. yeah. Do you want to share, I love this story and I've been watching you on Facebook for a while and you've been sharing the story of your um, your signs oh. being taken out of your yard by your crazy neighbor. <laughs> it's been going on for years that you have this, you guys have this ritual, I guess, that's been going on. I think it's keeping him spry. Um, actually, what happened was uh, the election two years ago, um, Randy Berman had made a whole ton of signs uh, about the election. And I got to and put them up in my yard and my neighbors are just diehard Republicans. Also, keep in mind that we're in Miami and I'm a woman living alone, so you know I'm the enemy already. And uh, the old guy next door kept stealing the signs. And so he stole two of them and I just thought, okay, this is kind of a pain. Um, so uh, Manita and Randy got me another two signs and I put them up and they got stolen too after a week. And it's very funny. He's got, he's got such a, a tell because our big trash is picked up on Fridays. So you would always get stolen Thursday nights. <laughs> they could just go out on Friday morning and, and take it out of the trash bin. Oh my God. Oh my God. It was hilarious. So then we got two more finally. And I tied one to a tree because I figured he'd need to get a ladder and I know he doesn't have one. And then we, we chained the other one to a cinder block, but it did eventually get stolen. Oh my God. One the tree though, that one remained. We've still got it. Okay. Yeah, it's just like a, it's just a, a crazy, crazy thing um, that having a sign like that could make somebody so angry that they would come like steal something out of your yard. Yes, it is unusual that they would feel they needed to do that. So but, uh, we thought for sure that the signs would get stolen this year because I have one that says we, we believe signs, you know, we believe in science and Black Lives Matter. And, but um, the wife's daughter has moved in and I think that might actually have prevented him from, you know, openly stealing stuff out of my yard. Oh, well, that's a plus. Maybe she um, had some good conversations with him <laughs> about the election as well. 
So that's good. Well, Kim, it was so great to catch up with you and to learn more about your practice. I, I didn't know you were working on so many things. So even though I follow you, I know you, you, we don't get to see everything that we're working on. So thank you so much. I want to go ahead, if you don't mind, um, what is it, not sharing your screen? I was going to oh. try to unmute everyone so they could say hi to you. Let me go ahead. Everybody can, um, I'm going to unmute everyone. Feel free to say hi. I came, I left everything that you're doing. Oh, oh I great. love you, Marco. <laughs> It was great. Great talk. Love Thank it. you. Thank great. you so much. I see Yasmin here. Hi. Haven't seen you in a while. It's good to see you. Yes. Nice you have to come to a talk. We would love yes. to hear what you're up to. All you have to do is be on TV. You can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you. Yeah. All right, Mrs. Kalas. That, that's because of my classes I teach, and it automatically put that. <laughs> oh, okay. I didn't it was iron typing it. I was already there. <laughs> oh, I'm getting so old. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so that, well, yeah, that was great. I, 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 can I get a recording of this since my students didn't come? Of course. Yeah, I have it recorded and it's okay. on Facebook. But I'll send you the recording tomorrow. I have Raymond will just do a quick edit for me because it seems like I forgot to hit record. So I'll have to. Um, I think every time I ask him to do one of these, you know. Yeah, that's okay. I don't blame him. I, I'm going to have about four or five Zooms tomorrow. So, oh, you, know, you are? Your life is probably that way too. Yes. It it's is. all the time. Everything. And I don't. I don't, there's something really, you know, <laughs> too much of them is not fun, but today this is the only one. So I was like, this, it, it makes it better if it's just the only one that day. <laughs> so. Yeah. And Kim, your work is so great. So thank you so much for sharing it with us. Yeah. I really think that, that bringing your life into your art like that is, is, it makes it so much more sustainable to keep being an artist too. Um, yeah, well, it makes it hard not to be an artist, really. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and your girls are creative too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How can they miss? And I saw, and you know what I love when I follow you on Facebook? I love all your Facebook. You, you crack me up. But like you had the Halloween costumes that you made and the flamingo. And I know you made all of them and they're really great. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's everything. We just, um, yeah. I mean, those of you who've seen my house know what it's like here. You know, um, the lady, the author who's Sharon Loudon, she wrote the book, Living and Sustaining a Creative Life, I think of you. Oh, I've never read it. Yeah, she, she talks about how artists can maintain that. And I think of you, because you're always living your artwork and sharing it with the rest of us. And you're very open about it. Yeah, I am, I'm very open. I was actually surprised when I was looking through for pictures. I was like, wow, I did a lot of stuff the past couple of years. Yeah, you don't realize how much stuff you do until you pull it all together, right? I, I see that, yeah, I see that, yeah. Yeah, and then I said it and Laurel rolled her eyes and she's like, look, it's all around you. <laughs> That's how I feel, I go, I didn't do anything and I start having to rifle through everything. Yes, yeah. yes. Yes. So it made more crap today too. So oh, no. oh you did? Oh, I can't wait to see it. <laughs> you know I I want to bring it to Emba. So but Kim, me and you have to work on something with um yeah. one of your projects. So absolutely. Love it. Sounds good. All right, everyone. Have a great night. Wear your mask, social distance. Um and we'll be back next Monday night. Uh we're having the BFA thesis uh panel discussion. So I look forward to seeing everyone then. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank bye, you. everyone. Bye. 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 bye.